Starting their Motown career journey in 1961 with founding member, then known as Mr. Otis Williams, the Temptations eventually found themselves skyrocketing to the top of the music charts with a multitude of hit songs and albums. Every group that came behind y'all tried to be the Temptations. Fast forward, now 61 years later, Dr. Otis Williams, the sole living original group member, is still rocking the house on a global scale with signature Temptation dance moves while performing on tour 35 weeks a year. I had the great pleasure to sit down with Dr. Williams and stroll down memory lane of his notable career journey. And you, dear readers, have a front row seat to enjoy my one-on-one -on -one conversation with this gracious music luminary. As always, enjoy. Otis Williams. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Otis Williams. Let's yes, start there. Yes, ma'am. So let's, let's um, I have a lot of questions. So you've got such an amazing history. It's kind of one of those where I want to get it all in, but I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay. So before we get to the doctor part. Yes. Let's start back to Texarkana. That's where it began. All right. So tell us a little bit about your your beginnings in Texarkana and how you made it to Detroit, Motor City. I was uh, raised by two wonderful grandmothers and the one that really instilled a lot of qualities in staying prayerful mm -hmm. was Mama Gooden mm -hmm. and my other grandmother, Mama Williams, on my uh, mother's side. And I'm old school to the point that uh, I used to have to slap hold. I used to have to get the eggs out uh, first thing in the morning. I would hear the rooster cock doo doo <laughs> You know, Otis, get up. Now you know what you got to do. Uh, I would have to uh, do all kind of farm work. Mm -hmm. To come from that, and then my mother brought me to Detroit. Then my uh, grandmother on my mother's side took over. And I came to Detroit when uh, I was about 12 or 13 years old. Okay. At the point, it was the infancy of rock and roll. Because mm -hmm. see, I was raised up on gospel music. Okay. Mama Good didn't play none of that, uh, you know, blues <laughs> stuff. No. It was gospel. All gospel, and she was a noted singer, so mm -hmm. people would come to see her, you know, uh, from miles around. So to hear that kind of music, and then when I got to Detroit, and I started hearing the Chuck Berries and the Jackie Wilsons and the, uh, the Elvis Presleys and whatever, I was amazed. I said, really? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that growing up. Yeah. And then, like I said, with rock and roll really beginning to take off, mm -hmm. they used to have rock and roll shows in Detroit at the Fox Theater. Okay. Now, the Fox Theater is the second largest indoor theater in America. Seats are about 5,000. Wow. I was about 15 or 16 years old, and I went to see one because I'm hearing all these here, you know, the Frank and Lyman and the Teenagers, the Clyde, McFadden, and the Drifters, and what have you. So I went to see um, who was on the show? Um, Frank and Lyman and the teenage, mm -hmm. uh, Teenagers, uh, the Cadillacs, the Royal Jokers, um, John come, 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 Jimmy. I can't think of his last name. So I'm looking at all the uh, all these talented people and. But I was looking around and I'm seeing all these people going crazy over what five guys were doing on stage. And when I saw that, the reaction that they were getting from the audience, uh -huh. I said right then and I said, that's what I want to do. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When uh, I formulated The Temptations, we were at the Fox. Okay. And this was like 1962, mm -hmm. 63. We were getting the same kind of accolades. Yeah, because the place was back. And mind you, we hadn't got our hits yet. We were so popular uh, that they would come to see us because of the Motown Review. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I said, wow, I'm up there doing what we have to do. But I'm reminiscing mm -hmm. of how it affected me when I was uh, about 15 or 16 years old. So from that time on, you know, uh, it's been a wonderful ride because we signed with Motown in 1961. Okay, well, let's start there. Let's go back <coughs> just a little bit. So you... You're the founding member of The Temptations? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how did you, so you were just saying how you saw these people on stage yes. and you were like, I want to do that. Yes. So how did you go about putting the group together? Uh, well, at first, my group was called Otis Williams in the Distance. Okay. At that time, my uh, personnel was Melvin Franklin, mm -hmm. Elbridge Bryant, James Crawford, Richard Street and myself. Okay. 
we were with a little small label called Northern Records. Now, we had a, a regional hit called Come On. And uh, Johnny May didn't have the kind of national distribution, but he got to be very popular in certain pockets of America. Mm -hmm. So uh, this one particular night, we had to do record ops. Now, back during those days, record ops, artists would have to go to the disc jockey's record ops if they wanted their record to be uh, played, okay. and especially if it's really doing well. Mm -hmm. So we went to do... Um, Frantic Ernie Durham at the uh, St. Stephen's Community Center. And Come On was so popular, I mean, because they played it over and over in different parts of the country. This one particular night, Mr. Gordy came in with the Miracles. The Miracles had shop around and uh, got a job uh, as hits. Mm -hmm. So we were still up on stage doing our thing, and I'm saying, wow, that's, <laughs> that's burying it and smoking the Miracles. You know? <laughs> So I said, yeah, but the audience kept calling us back, you mm -hmm. know. So finally, when we were able to come off, uh, I came off and I'm standing there. And just so having fate was to uh, have Mr. Gordy standing next to me. And he said, I like that record you guys have out. Come see me. I'm starting my own company. The hit he maker's did, uh, newest star when he saw yeah, it. Evidently, because that record was so popular. <laughs> and he gave me his card, mm -hmm. you know. And we became very disenchanted with Johnny May. Johnny Mae Matthews sold a master. Mm -hmm. you know, by that, I mean she, could, she sold it to Warwick Records in New York City, okay. which was a national company. They could get it all over the country. Mm -hmm. So she came back to Detroit and she, she just counted out all these $100 bills. She said, ah, your boy's going to be heard everywhere, all over the country now. National distribution. I said, oh, that's great, Johnny. So as she's counting <laughs> out the hits, the money, I said, uh, did we get any royalties? I, you know, I wrote the song, come on. Mm. She stopped. She looked at me and she said, well, you ain't getting none of this money. Uh-oh. That's what I said. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I said, but Johnny, a statement or something, because I have, you're not getting any of this money. Mm. So I said, oh, and now mind you, I was about 19, uh, excuse me, going on 20. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I think we better leave. Gone. I'll keep the name, mm. the uniforms, and the car. And the car had Otis Williams in the distance written on the side. And, uh, I said, well, we're young, we don't care. And little did she know, I had already talked to Mr. Gordy. Okay. So when uh, I said, well, we're leaving. Mm -hmm. So I guess she thought we were just going to pass out. Yeah. I called Mr. Gordy. He said, uh, I said, Mr. Gordy, we're no longer with that company. Oh, really? Good. Come on over here and to Motown and see Mickey Stevens. Mm -hmm. And we went to Motown, and Mickey Stevens was the A&R man for Motown at the time. Okay. And we went down there, and as we were singing, now, at that time, I had lost... A couple of guys. That's when uh, Eddie Kendricks, mm -hmm. Paul Williams, mm -hmm. Melvin Franklin, and Al was still with us, and myself. And he loved our harmonies, you know, because see, we were five Southern brothers mm -hmm. that could sing gospel. I mean, mm -hmm. we give Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirs and yeah. the harmonizing for and all them guys. Oh, we give them a run for their money mm -hmm. because before we started singing R&B, we just start our rehearsal off singing gospel. Yeah. So, um, Ms., uh, um, uh, Mickey Stevens said. I love you guys, and Mr. Gordy's gonna be crazy about y'all because Melvin down there in the, you know, with that deep ba uh, bass and Eddie soaring tenor and the harmony all in between. Mm -hmm. And as it would happen, Mr. Gordy loved us and signed us, and I still have the contract hang hanging up in my house, uh, March of 1961. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so now you're in, in Motown, right? a part of Motown. Tell me what was it like when you, when you guys got your first hit, like like uh, you were on that stage and, and yeah. you, like, what was that moment when you were like, we made it? Yeah. What did that feel like? You know, we recorded about five or six singles before we got the way you do the things you do. Mm -hmm. And they were calling the Temptations and the Supremes the, the no hit wonders, because mm. Mr. Gordon never gave up hope on the Supremes nor the Temps. Yeah. So uh, we were a working group. By that I mean we would go up to Muskegon, Lansing, Saginaw and work. So we would come, uh, we'd be away from Motown for a certain amount of time and when we would come back, one of the um, guys said, where have you guys been? Well, he said, well, you know, we work, we were up in uh, Muskegon. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a hit. And that time it was just uh, uh, David Ruffin and myself. Mm -hmm. We said, say what? He said, get the cash for <laughs> the billboard. And, so we saw and they said, 96 with a bullet. Mm. And see how the way you do the things you do came about. 
Smoke, he said they were riding, the Miracles of Him were riding in the car, and they were just singing. And I guess Bobby Rogers, I think he was one of the writers. And mm -hmm. you got a smile so bad, and so smoking and picked it up. Mm -hmm. So when he got back to Detroit, he said, I'm going to have the temps to record this. Smokey called us, and it was a cold January night. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, oh, get the boys. I got a hit for you guys. Uh, and at the time, that's when David Ruffin had just joined us. Okay. David Ruffin, Eddie Kendricks, Paul Williams, Melvin Franklin, and myself. It was a cold January night. We walked up to Motown. And when we came in to uh, record, uh, we went upstairs to the piano where Smokey was, and he passed out the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the lyrics and saying, you got a smile so bright. <laughs> could have been a candle. Holding you so tight. Could've... I'm saying, this is some hokey mess here. <laughs> <laughs> we went downstairs in the studio and we recorded, you know, mm -hmm. the way you do the things you do. So I sat and listened at it. And I came up to the uh, control room where Smokey, I said, Smokey. You a bad man. <laughs> you take you took something that made no sense and you made it make sense. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, the way you do the things you do was running up the charts. Wow. 1964, mm. all the way up here it is 2023. Temps has been on the roll. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So speaking <laughs> of the Temps in general, where did the name come from? Well, when we left Johnny Mae Matthews, like I said, she took the name, the Otis Williams, in the distance. Mm -hmm. We were nameless for a minute, and so uh, we thought about calling ourselves the El Domingos and what have you. So the El Domingos? Uh-huh. That's in my play. Okay. The guy said the same thing. What's an El Domingo? <laughs> so, uh, so at the time, David Ruffin, no, at the time it was still Al mm -hmm. and Eddie Paul Melvin and myself. We were standing out in front of Motown. And we were trying to think of a name. A young man that worked for Motown named Bill Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just throwing our names, just throwing our names. And so Bill said, what about the temptation? I said, I like that. And uh, the guys, uh, so I said, yeah, let's do that. And, I, and Paul said, Otis, a name is whatever uh, it is. We'll make it be something. Mm -hmm. So Bill called up, hollered up to legal, put on the contract, the temptations. And, uh, and we really dodged a bullet because it was a white group called The Temptations. Okay. They had, a, I think the hit was Barbara Ann, but mm -hmm. it didn't do anything and they never did challenge us about the name. Mm -hmm. So we shoo, shoo, dodged the bullet on mm -hmm. that one, mm -hmm. you know, and we've been riding it ever since. Now I find it interesting that you say <laughs> that um, the Supremes and The Temptations were like the no, no, the no wonders. hit. And they're like the two top mm -hmm. amazing Motown groups. Yeah. Isn't that funny how life yeah. switches around? That's the beauty of Barry Gordy. Mm -hmm. He believed in the artists. So yeah. whenever, uh, like the Supremes and the Temps and whomever, if they kept going in and, and uh, didn't get a hit, he said, it's not the artist's fault. Mm -hmm. We got to do better as a, as a recording company, as awesome. producers, as songwriters. Mm -hmm. So he kept us going in. Most companies, if you did not click in the first or second one, they'd drop you like a bad habit. Yeah, yeah. Barry didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he believed in us enough that the, uh, the Supremes got where did I love going. They've been rolling ever since. Mm -hmm. The way you do the things you do for the Temps, and we've been rolling ever since. And that's a part that I love about Barry because he didn't give up on us. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's how it happened. And here we are still going. One thing about Motown and the history of Motown is it's often thought about as like a family. Yes. And so speaking of what you're saying about Mr. Gordy, um, it, it, that runs seems to run true for you know yes. how he ran his business. Yes. So, is there a particular song that you hold dear to your heart, and if so, why? Oh, well, I, see what you just asked. I have a I am a big Temptation fan. When I look at <laughs> see our discography, mm -hmm. I say, Ooh, wow! I never would imagine. But I would have to say first and foremost, aside from the way you do the things you do, mm -hmm. my girl. My girl. And that's, it's not everybody's like favorite. Yeah, but it's, at it's, first, you know, when Smokey, Smokey came to see us at a very popular club in Detroit called the 20 Grand. Mm -hmm. And we were rolling with the way you do the things you do, I'll be in trouble. So mm -hmm. he was amazed because he hadn't seen us in a while. Mm -hmm. And he was, man, you guys are something else, all the choreography and all of us being the same height. And he came backstage and he was, you know, really saying how much he appreciated the show. Mm -hmm. But then he stopped and he looked at David Ruffin and he said, I got a song for you. Mm. Now we were 22, 23, so we were young and man, bring it on, we can sing anything. <laughs> you know, so just so happened we had to work at the 
Apollo mm -hmm. was smoking the miracles. They were headlining and we were co star Okay. In between the shows, he would have us to come to his dressing room, him and Ronnie White, because Ronnie White was one of the writers, mm -hmm. and they would rehearse us. So when we went back to Detroit, uh, we had to go in the studio with Smokey and do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, at that time, uh, my girl just, okay, another great song by Smokey's, but we never had uh, any kind of inclination that it would become what it is known for today. So we went and did the recording and uh, put the voices on, and then we stayed around, then the horns and the strings. And I always say when Paul Reiser added the strings mm -hmm. to my girl, and I started as young, ba -do -de -do 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 -do, I'm standing there and saying, ooh, this song has taken on a whole nother daylight. So I came up and went in the studio. I said, smoking, I don't know how big a record this is going to become, but this is going to be a big record. Oh, okay, Oak. He called me Oak even mm -hmm. way back then. And when they released it, Motown released My Girl uh, December mm -hmm. of 1964. We were at the Apollo Theater February. Uh, 1965, mm -hmm. in my home today, I still have uh, Barry sent us a telegram congratulating us. We were number one. The uh, Supreme sent us a telegram congratulating us. Mm -hmm. The Beatles sent us a telegram congratulating us. And Jules Bordell, who ran the Copacabana, because when we played the Copacabana, we broke all existing records that were at Motown. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, at the uh, Copa. And you know, when you think about the Sammy Davis Juniors and the Frank Sinatras and the real heavyweight, yeah. and here we would come a few years later, it was pandemonium at the Copacabana. Yeah, um, Coca, the um, plane at the Coca, Coca Cabana. No, that's not right. Copa. Copa, thank you. I'm <laughs> thank you, Copa. <laughs> that place. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was a, a real big milestone, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. See, uh, one of the beauties of Motown, aside from having so many hits, like I tell artists, there's a sit-down section in our show that we do today. Mm -hmm. And I said, now, I'm going to tell you something. And I said, I'm a factoid person. I read a lot about whatever that catches my interest. Mm -hmm. I said, there will never, ever be another recording company like Motown Records. Mm -hmm. The whole audience would applaud. Mm -hmm. Motown came along during the turbulent 60s. Yeah. Motown sent their artists to school. Yeah. No other recording company ever thought about that. What? Send them to school for what? Mm -hmm. Barry and a young, uh, man by the name of Harvey Fuqua used to sing with Harvey and the Moon Glows. Mm -hmm. We have all these talented artists. We need to groom them. Mm -hmm. So they developed this uh, uh, division called Artist Development. Yeah. And they had some wonderful thespians that would teach us. We had all this raw talent, but they wanted to refine us. Mm -hmm. And uh, they taught us a lot of our presentation, how to carry ourselves. But Maurice King said, you're being watched more off stage than on stage because you know, they know what you're supposed to do on stage. Yeah. What kind of uh, person are you off stage? So they really instill a lot of things in us. And he said, and we, I tell this to our audience, there's four things that you can never tell anybody. I don't care, family member or, or whomever. I said, we said, what, Mr. King? He said, religion, mm -hmm. politics, mm -hmm. money, and who they should and should not make love to. And when I tell it to the artists, they be, oh, yeah, yep, yep, mm -hmm, that's right. You look over there. <laughs> you know, so it was a wonderful educational period for us because uh, not only were we having hits, but they were grooming us. Mm -hmm. And during the 60s, like I tell the artists, Motown's music was like a soothing ornament to a troubled soul because, you yeah. know, it was uh, chaotic back then, as it is today. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, the artists was very appreciative appreciative of that. Sure. So they instill a lot of wonderful values in us, aside from just having hits. Mm -hmm. And I, we carry that forth today. Yeah, I would say <clears throat> that um, the artist development is really what set Motown artists mm -hmm. apart in true. general, and then everyone started copying. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, you guys true. set the tone for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, let's move, move down the road into more to today. Number one, you have more stamina than I do. <laughs> Let's just get that straight here. How are you keeping on doing what you're doing? It's yeah. so impressive. At 81 years old. At 81 years old. You know what? I'm very thankful. I've learned a lot. See, show business can break you down mm -hmm. if you let it. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say I, I was a, a saint. You know, but I, one thing I learned about myself, 
I would see artists doing something. I said, I ain't doing that. <laughs> Not me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think with me having that within, yeah. I'm able to value myself first. Sure. And because uh, I've lost my brothers, Eddie, David, Paul, Melvin, yeah. uh, Dennis, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, so I learned what not to do. Yeah. And I try and take care of myself, you know, because, uh, you know, when we first broke out, having hits, you know, okay, we parted. But when I moved here to, in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1974, I was about 35 years old, man, mm -hmm. uh, 34, 35. And I was in the elevator because uh, I lived on Doheny. And I said, Otis, now see, being out here in L.A., or you can, get, you can get sucked into a whole lot of bad vices. Yeah. And I would see that because we had been coming to L.A. since 1964. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of the things that I said, not me, partying, <laughs> you know. So uh, when my play came out, and uh, we were over in Germany, mm -hmm. and a man came up to me and he said, Mr. Williams, and I was eight here today, mm -hmm. you are an inspiration to a lot of people. Yeah. And... Uh, I said, thank you. He said, no, I really mean that. And he must have been there about in the, you know, that age bracket. But I've learned to t take care of myself. And that's why, you know, when we finish today, even when we perform, I go back to my room. I take a lot of different magazines because I love to read. Yeah. And when I'm arrested enough, I sketch. Mm. Or I'm writing songs like Ollie Woodson and myself, the late great Ollie Woodson, him and I wrote Treat Her Like a Lady, a song called To Be Continued. Mm -hmm. So I love writing. In fact, the very first hit that the champs, uh, the distance had, I wrote, based wow. on Ronnie Isaac's uh, shout. Mm -hmm. Well, my record, well, you know, you make me want to love you in the morning. Uh, shout was, you know, well, you know, you make me want to shout. Mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So I took it from that, and Mr. Gordy heard it. I mean, Jenna May heard it, and uh, we had a local hit. So uh, I, I'm a creative person, but the key to being able to be around, you got to take care of yourself. Excuse me. Yes. Um, also. Um, when you're on stage, there's so much movement, yes. so much dancing, mm -hmm. and you've got to have the stamina for that. And those aren't necessarily all just real simple moves. No. You know, and it's repetitive, and it's, mm -hmm. it's nonstop. You know what was told to me? I was being interviewed about three or four years ago, and I was about 74, 75. And a guy during the course of the interview, he said, Mr. Williams, we love the temptation. We just love the temptation. We want y'all to be around for a long time. I said, yeah, we plan on being around, you know, for a long time. Uh, I said, but let me ask you something. What about if we get up in our 80s? And I hadn't jumped over the 80s. And, mm -hmm. and you, you still expect us to do all that carpet? Yes. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, really? He said, oh, yeah, no. I, I don't think they would accept us just to come up and stand mm -hmm. because we're known for our choreography, aside from the harmonies and the song. Yeah. So when I heard that, I said I did a re-evaluation of myself, like, Otis, take care of your black behind. <laughs> <laughs> because they expect for you to still continue to do that. Yep. And uh, we just got home this past Monday. And let me tell you something. I really, I told Derek, I said, I've learned about my recuperative powers of myself. Mm -hmm. Because when I walked into my house, I was tired than three, four fat men. <laughs> <laughs> I, my legs, That's I was pretty tired. Oh, yeah, I, I was moving like Robocop, <laughs> you know, get, trying to get to my bed. <laughs> and, I, you know, uh, I'm still trying to recoup from that. But see, what had happened, we did two shows of 75 minutes. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of dance over two that's, shows. That's a lot. Uh -huh. Then we had to do two shows with the tops. Mm -hmm. The two shows that we did 75 minutes, that was just the temps. Mm. Then when we met up with the tops, it was two shows for 60 minutes. Then Derek and myself had to fly to England mm. because my play opened up there uh, last week. So uh, they wanted me to come over and meet the cast and what have you. Yeah. So we ca got off the stage, flew to England, and met the people over there that was part of my show. And then had to turn right around, Derek and I had to fly back because uh, Shelly, my manager, said, oh, did you need to stay for the uh, after party? I can't do it, Shelly. Doves, doves, come on. I said, Shelly, Derek is talking about leaving at 5 o'clock in the morning. It was almost 11 o'clock then. And then we had to fly from London wow. all the way to Chicago. And it was a chore getting through from the international to the domesticated side mm -hmm. and going through all that. By the time Derek and I got to Omaha, Nebraska, mm -hmm. I was spent. You said two things. Two things I want to um, discuss. Number one, you mentioned Shelly, Shelly Berger. Yes. I saw in one of your interviews that Shelly has been your manager yes. for a very long time. But what impressed me is to this day, you don't even have a contract. I know. 
it's a it's a handshake. Yeah. That's how uh -huh. that's how things were done yeah. based on merit, based on character, yes. integrity, and yeah. that's so impressive. Yeah, uh, Shelly and I was truly old school because mm -hmm. that's unheard of. Yeah. When I do tell people, what? They don't have no man, please. And then when I had a meeting, uh, a luncheon with LL Cool J, mm -hmm. and he was, and I. Had, we Motown had, you know, stopped recording, and uh, he was telling me about the new business. He said, oh, this, you know, that's a 360 clause. I said, a what? <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, it's a 360 clause in the business now. I said, uh, what's the 360 clause, LL? He said, that means once you sign that contract, they can get everything that you uh, were to come up with. Wow. Song, publishing, what? I said, I'm old school. I don't know if I'm going to go for all that. Mm -hmm. He said, well, that's what it is now then. Wow. You know, so. Uh, uh, it's really different. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, so. And I'm not that impressed with a lot of stuff that I hear on the radio, you know. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade. But, see, when we were at Motown, Miss Edwards was our first manager. Mm -hmm. And we were doing the way you do the things you do in My Girl phonetically for yeah. Germany and for Paris. So, and during the course of us singing, uh, she said, now, Temps, no cussing. Mm -hmm. That was 1964, 65. Yeah. We said, Miss you know, we don't do that. Yeah. You turn on the radio now. Oh, yeah. You know, so we, we don't play that. And uh, it just shows you the one thing that's constant in life is change. That's true. That's true. Even I was singing something the other day because I like the beat and I like mm -hmm. the sound. Yeah. And then I was like, Wait a minute! Did they just say uh, yeah, that? Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm just going, and I'm like, oh, that's what that. Yeah, see? It, it caught me off guard, and right. you know, I'm no saint either, but that caught me uh, off guard. Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to not go back. I want to move forward to okay. you. Also mentioned your play. Yes. So let's talk about that a little bit. You know, Miss Duxworth, now she's going to kill me, but <laughs> she said, oh, just don't tell me. Don't tell her. I said, I got to. <laughs> I will sit here because we believe that you would make good copy. So I said, good copy? What is that? <laughs> we would like to do a book about your life story. Now, this mm -hmm. was 1986, there about. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, oh, okay. Caught me completely off guard. And I said, well, call Shelly and, uh, you know, let's work it out. Mm -hmm. She said, with Shelly. Worked it out. Now, we started in 1986. The book came out in 1988, I believe. Okay. Who would have uh, imagined that from that book, mm -hmm. from Melvin Duxworth, all the way from that to 10 years later, the miniseries. Mm. We were in Las Vegas, and they showed it. And people tell me, man, have you seen your, your life story about the Temps? No, I haven't. You got to watch it. <laughs> I said, okay. And, over and over again, even today. And I, you know, I didn't listen or look at it until last year because there's a segment in there where I lost my son. I'm sorry. And I didn't, even when I said, I don't want to see that because it makes me think about Lamont. Mm -hmm. So we were in uh, D.C. Uh, and Smokey, we were at, I can't think of this big, important event, but Smokey heard that I hadn't seen my mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. I'm in my ministry. And he called me, Oak, man, you mean, you haven't watched your, your miniseries? I said, no, nah, Smokey, I haven't watched it. Why? How come, Oak? I said, well, you know, it's you know, about my son. Oak, uh, get you a box of Kleenex and watch it. I said, well, let me ask you something. Have you watched it? Yeah, Oak. I get me a box of Kleenex and I sit down and watch it, even if I'm crying. <laughs> you know, and he wrote one of the songs mm -hmm. uh, to it. So we got into Atlanta last year when I sat down. And when we checked in, just so happened it must have been fate. I got in and I got on the television and... The miniseries was on. Uh, okay, let me just watch it. So I'm watching it, and I'm watching it, and I'm saying, uh, oh, yeah, I, I like the hair. She is good. I'm saying, that's good. And I sat and watched it, and I told some. I said, I watched it. See, I told you it's good. And mm -hmm. they said that have been one of, like, the number one miniseries from the time it came on wow. all the way up to now. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to another jump. When uh, the play came about, mm -hmm. at first, like I was telling Shelly, Melvin and myself had talked to somebody, and they were uh, Warner Brothers was interested in doing the Temp's life story. Yeah. 
So we were happy. So we called, I called Shelly, and I said, yeah, Shelly, um, Warner Brothers is thinking about doing it. And Suzanne, what year is this? This was like 1980-something. Uh, okay. Yeah, 80 or early 90s. Mm -hmm. And Shelly said, Otis, you need to come to the office. We need to talk to you and Melba. I said, but Shelly, he said, yeah, uh, come to the office and get something. Weird. It's good news, but we want to tell you something. Mm -hmm. So Melvin and I, we went to Shelly's office, and Suzanne, the pastor, was there, and we told her about Warner Brothers was mm -hmm. interested in doing it. She said, well, that's good, and Otis. She said, but we're going to do the miniseries uh, you know, on television. So it was like taking the winds out of ourselves. What? <laughs> television? She said, let me tell you the power of television. Mm. She said, when you get ready to go to a movie, what you got to do? You got to get up. You got to put on your clothes. You got to get in your car. You got to spend money. You got to get out and yep. do that. Maybe it's it's like television. work. Yeah. She said, she said, television? You see some? oh, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sit at home and watch that. She said, that's the power of TV. The comfort of your own home. Own home. Don't have to go nowhere but sit mm -hmm. right there. So when they... Uh, we, uh, Shelly and I, we went into Pittsburgh. See, they didn't shoot it in Detroit mm. because uh, we were told they sent, uh, uh, what they call it, location managers, uh, sent, uh, people that go to where they want to shoot it. Yeah, yeah. Detroit had, had that, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had uh, that worst riot, okay. you know, in one of yeah. America's history. Mm -hmm. So when they went to Detroit, they came back and told Suzanne that the past, we can't shoot it in Detroit. Detroit do not look like Detroit when the uh, Motown and everybody was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Detroit was devastated. That's sad. And they shot it in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So when Shelly and I, we flew into Pittsburgh, and I'm, I'm, I must have counted about 18 big semi-trailers. And I said, mm -hmm. man, what? He said, oh, it's a movie, but it's going to be on TV. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, met, sat and watched. And it, was, it was a bigger production than what you uh, imagined. Yeah, yeah, you thought sure. TV was like small. Yeah, a little, you know, a little T90 kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, scene. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was massive. And when they released it, we were in Vegas at first, and then we had to fly here to L.A. and do a private show. Mm -hmm. And when we finished, they said, man, you got to watch this miniseries. I said, really? They said, yeah, it's really good. You know, so from that and then... Uh, when we got word, because Shelley had been saying that we wanted, he wanted to do a play about the Tim's life story. Mm -hmm. But we had to wait, uh, because Mr. Gordy said, Shelley, you and Otis can do this, but you got to wait till I do my life story. Oh, okay. So we were, and you know, <laughs> we had to hold up for about, uh, I guess, four or five years, you mm -hmm. know, until he finished his book, then he did his. And so that makes sense, so there's no competition between you though. Yeah, and coming out at the same time. Yeah, and, and you both get like full billing. He yeah. can, you know, he gets his full time mm -hmm. and you get your full time and there's no crossover like competition. True. And he is Barry Gordy. Well he's yeah, he, because he gave us the right shell and myself to do it. Yeah. But we had to wait until he finished his. Mm -hmm. So when he his you know did his thing and then when I got word that mine was green lighted, you mm -hmm. know, for to be made, Shell and I we flew into New York and I saw the early, early embryonic stages of what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, I was like a little kid, mm -hmm. like this is Christmas, and I'm saying, look, ooh, look, look, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And I'm sitting there, and the early cast, they showed, let me see the first setting of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there, and when they did the first part of it, I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around like this here. <laughs> I hope I'm not the only one sitting up here crying. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so when they did their first half, uh, the whole cast, I got up, the whole cast surrounded me. Oh. And I told them, I said, you guys and girls, mm -hmm. y'all moved me to tears. Yeah. I said, you got me sitting there crying. So one of the guys said, men cry too. <laughs> oh, I said, it's true. You know, I said, I never would imagine. That was the early embryonic stages of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so the director said, um, uh, all right, Otis, you, we want to excuse you now because we're getting ready to do the heavy part. Okay. I'm saying, what's the heavy part they didn't want me to say? Ah, no, you just got to go. That's, that was the part I'm losing, guys. Yeah. And they didn't want me to see that just yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was very impressed. And then when I flew into San Jose, uh, that, is it San Jose? I think it was up there. Uh, one of the theaters up there, they got a mental block. So when I saw the entirety of it, 
I'm sitting there, and people knew who I was sitting, you know, in the audience. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sitting there, I'm watching, and when it got to the sensitive part, the people around me slowly craned it <laughs> to see my reaction. Yeah. And I would give it to them. I said, yeah, I'm sitting up here crying too. Mm -hmm. Good, Mr. Williams. <laughs> and uh, halftime came up, you know, and uh, one lady walked up to me, uh, to me and she said, Mr. Williams, you have lived a very interesting life. Mm -hmm. She said, your play could be as big as um, that, the real big one. Now, I can't think of the name of it right now. I said, well, if we do any kind of successful uh, note of what that one's doing, uh, I'm happy, mm -hmm. you know. And that was going on four years ago now, you know. Wow. So, and it's uh, just opened up in England. And it was pandemonium in the audience, this uh, St. Edward's uh, Theater. So you just mentioned England, and you've mentioned out of the country a little earlier, but how does that feel to continue to have that an international appeal? After what, sixty-one years now? Yes, sixty-one years. And you're still you're you're float you're you're floating around you're flying around internationally. I mean, I'm just giving that like letting mm -hmm. that sink in. Yes. That that's how long that you've been performing, but you know there is um, like one night or what do they call it um, one hit wonders yes. and all of that. Yeah. But but yeah. the longevity that you have yeah. is so impressive. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's legendary, you know, you're a legend. So tell us, like, what are you doing today, right now? Well, right now I'm still riding the hair off the horse. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still having fun with it. Yeah. Uh, I'm blessed, you know, that, you know, show business is so fickle. Yeah. You could be up here one minute, and the next thing you know, you're looking down at shoe heels of people walking. Yeah. You know, and I am very blessed to uh, still be able to do it. And what's so killing about it, this group, after me losing David, Eddie, Paul, Melvin, Dennis, Allen, mm -hmm. some great, some brothers that stand right there and could sing to make you touch your heart emotion, mm -hmm. we're still going on. There's a reason. Yeah, and I give it to God first and foremost, you know, because my grandmothers, yeah. Yeah, they were old school, uh, you know, very, you know, church going, and they would yeah. feed that into me when I was a little shorty doo wop, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I still adhere to what both my grandmothers uh, taught me. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, this group has been around for a reason, for a purpose. Mm -hmm. Because, like I said, when, during the 60s, uh, Motown was a necessary event because we would go around to uh, certain uh, places try and uplift spirits, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, let them know that, uh, you know, there's a purpose, even yeah. though we're being uh, going through what, what we were going through as a, as a country, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, uh, something happened last year that uh, I was very touched. Uh, during 64, 65, we played a date down in uh, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, there was a rope right down the center of the auditorium. Mm -hmm. Blacks on one side, whites on the other. So the classic tips, uh, was, we were together at the time. And when we came to the place and looked out at the audience, we said, man, you got to be kidding, mm -hmm. really? Mm -hmm. So we went out and did what we had to do. Came back to that same theater the next year. Mm -hmm. There was no rope. Blacks okay. and whites sitting side by side, high-fiving each other, mm -hmm. and booty banging, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. February of last year, we played Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. So Derek said, uh, Otis says, a man out here like to talk to you. So mm -hmm. I'm getting uh, dressed after doing the show. And I came out and I said, hey, I'm Otis Williams. He said, I know who you are. He said, Mr. Williams, I am the little boy that put that rope down the center of the, uh, that auditorium. From years ago? I didn't want to, but they made me do it. Wow. And I stood, I stood there and I'm saying, my mouth gapped open because I would always think back, who was that? Yeah. And so when he walked away, I said, so there, I said, man, he said, you know who that was, don't you? I said, yeah, that's still, he said, no, that was God. Mm-hmm. I said, you're right. 1964, 65, here it is, 2022, and he came all the way with his daughter to let me know it was him. He that was sitting to. on his heart. It was. Mm hmm But that showed the power of Motown and uh, what they were doing. Yeah. He didn't like it, but he was a little shorter, mm -hmm. and he did it. 
So it lets me know that we are around for a lot of different purposes. Yeah. You know, uh, um, I tried to hold my emotions when I tell this one. I still get fan mail. Mm -hmm. and of course I, you do. Yeah, well, you know, I, <laughs> I'm modest. And uh, I got this one fan mail from our daughter mm -hmm. concerning her mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, she said, Mr. Williams, would you call once you get this here uh, information? So I call. And I said, yeah, this is Otis Williams up to 10th. So I'm answering your call. Mm -hmm. The daughter said, oh, okay, Mr. Williams, thank you. Hold on, let me get my mother. Okay. She went, and the mother got on the phone. And the first thing she said, I asked God to don't take me until I talk to Otis Williams. Wow. I was caught off guard with that one. Mm -hmm. She repeated, I asked God don't take me until I talk to Otis Williams. Mm -hmm. She ran down with my group, mm -hmm. the impact that we had on her life during the time she was here. Yeah. And I'm sitting there listening, tears running down my eyes. Wow. And then when she finished, she said, now God, you can take me. No. You let me talk to Otis Williams. Oh. I'm telling you. Wow. Wow. That is so touching. Yep. So, geez. Everybody's <laughs> okay. I want to cry. I know, right? I'm yeah. like, okay. Oh, yeah, me too. Oh. Yeah. Well, I tell you what. You tell me about your awards, and then I'm going to move on to something else. Oh, okay. Tell me about the awards that you guys have. Um, you, you've had a recent award for, um, you have to help me out on that. Um, Recent award for um, just in 2020, what, what year are we in? 23? 23. 20, 2022, did you, weren't you just awarded something? Uh, you know what? I'm lost at time. When I walk around in my house and people that I uh, do let come in, they walk around and they tell me, oh my God, I have five uh, Grammys. Mm -hmm. uh, you walk down the hall throughout my house, there's uh, all kind of gold, platinum. Yeah. Uh, I got citations from presidents, mm -hmm. uh, governors, mm -hmm. uh, all kind of things that I never would imagine that yeah. we would achieve. And there's, when you come down the hall uh, in my uh, house, there's a life-size picture of the classic Thames. Mm -hmm. So when people come around that I do let come in the house, they, they come in, they look at me, and they stop me and they say, oh my God, look at this. And I've been told, Otis, oh, should you sell your house? sign your name mm. on the, each one of those big pictures. Yeah. I said, oh, really, why? He said, your house is valuable as it is. That would shoot it up even more. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, really? Uh, yeah, we are forever getting a, a, an award for all kind of wonderful achievements that yeah. I can keep up with them. And I know I, I, I had the, um, the question in my head, but then the little tearjerker uh, statement that you were saying about the lady, my, my brain just went shrew. Yeah, I, yeah. mine too. <laughs> I, I get kind of touched on that one myself. Yeah. You know. Okay, so this is what I said in the very beginning. I'm going to circle back around it. So you were talking about awards. So let's get to the Dr. Otis Williams. So where did the doctor come from? You know, I, like I said, I never would imagine that I would be able to acquire such a wonderful phenomenon, you know, because all I ever wanted to do was just sing and bring happiness and do my little steps with my group and what have you. But uh, I forgot how this really came about, but I was awarded this. So I had to go down to, I mean, not Tuskegee, but uh, Lord, they would kill me if I, I got a brain fart if it ever was. <laughs> uh, well, you and I, we've got that going uh, on right wow. now. <laughs> and I went to uh, uh, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, had to put on you know, the robe and what have you. And uh, I guess you call him the chancellor. The head. Yeah. yeah. So after uh, I uh, was given my uh, award, and it's for human letters. Mm. Uh -huh. And I said, well, human letters, that means you, you touch people in a very special way. Yeah. And he said, uh, now, and he talked with reverence. And uh, Dr. Williams, you must tell people they must always refer to you as Dr. Otis Williams, not Otis Williams anymore. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, sir. So I'm saying to myself, hi in the hell, I'm going to be able to tell all my friends, you can't call me Otis Williams anymore, you got to call me doctor. I didn't want to sound facetious. <laughs> and bow so, with that. And <laughs> bow, yeah, you know, so I didn't want to come off too, too over the top. But, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it was through what I've been doing, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm trying to think of how... Somebody approached me and uh, 
said, you need a doctorate. Yeah. And I have uh, two of the same kind uh, in my home. That's so you know? nice. Yeah, I I, I, like I said, I never would imagine that I would Well acquire. deserved. Well, I, I, man upstairs. That's right. Yeah. I tell people he left me here for a reason, mm -hmm. you know. And people, I've been asked, well, Otis, when you're looking for uh, a singer, what are you looking for? You know, what kind of voice? I said, well, naturally, the talent is important. But you know what? I don't look at the talent first. And when I said that to one guy, he looked at me quizzical, crane neck backwards. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> I said, no. I said, you can have all the talent in the world. But excuse me, I'm going to say it like I tell him. But if you're an asshole of a person, you're going to negate the talent. That's right. And they would say, oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. I said, yeah, you have to have talent, mm -hmm. but it's up here and here. Yeah. Show business can be so demanding, and it will test your resolve, mm -hmm. or if you have any resolve at all. That's right. Because, excuse the pun, uh, there's so much temptation that you can give <laughs> into anything and lose yourself uh, mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah. And uh, like I said, uh, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to maintain who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you know, like I say, I ain't going to sit up and confess that I was a saint. I didn't get over into the stuff that I saw guys do. Mm -hmm. I used to smoke some grass. That was mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't want to sit up that way. I'm just trying to make himself sound like he's more. No. Or it's just being real. Like I said, I'm no saint. Yeah. But when I start seeing them doing a the dip dip and uh, drinking the alcohol, mm -hmm. I, said, I ain't doing that because I learned that when you do too much of that uh, cocaine, it, it messes with yeah. the body. That uh, well, you're still here. Yeah. So we are. We we know you. You know yeah. you didn't yeah. partake. No, no, no. <laughs> I I like to control me, not no drugs control yeah. me. You know. So I've been very fortunate and blessed to be able to maintain who I am mm -hmm. and still keep my equilibrium and be respectful because, like I said, show business is so fleeting that uh, it don't have to happen. And if it happens, yeah. how long are you going to ride the hair off the horse? Mm -hmm. I'm still riding the hair off the horse. When I get off, it's going to be ball. There you go. There you go. Well, you're a legend, so I'm going to ask you this one last question. Oh, you can say, I'm enjoying it. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it also. So with what's coming down the pipeline, and um, the music of the future. You've got a grandson. Yeah, Trace. Trace Austin. Tra Trace Austin, he just turned 19 uh, mm -hmm. this month. And uh, we were appearing uh, outside of LA. Uh, he must have been about five years old. Mm -hmm. And my daughter uh, and her husband, they had him dressed up so cute. And, you know, he had the long hair at the time and they dressed him up real cute. And, they came out uh, to see us. Mm -hmm. So we did the show and what have you. And uh, when we came off the, for the final thing, I said, come on, Tracy, and come out here with uh, Grandpa and uh, the Temps and bow. So when we came out, and I said, come on now, bow with the Temps. So mm -hmm. he did his little bow, and he <laughs> came up. But when he walked out the whole row and said, oh, look at that little fella. He is so cute. And his, dad, his father was going to be a uh, uh, running back for the New York Jets, mm -hmm. but he messed up his knee. Oh, no. Trace told uh, his father, I don't want to play football. I want to do what Grandpa do. Mm -hmm. And he's pursuing his own uh, niche in the business. That's awesome. He's writing uh, his, uh, his lyrics. He's studying piano, drums. And I went to see him a few weeks ago uh, do his little rap. So, uh, yeah, he's still having a lot of fun. At, just turned 19, I said, now Trace, you know, show business gonna test you. Yeah. And then sometimes it's not gonna be quick and easy. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to stay there, stay, uh, stay with it if you really wanna do this. Yeah. Oh yeah, Grandpa, uh, this is what I wanna do because I wanna play no football. So uh, yeah, he's and handsome. The girls look at him and about, that's your who? <laughs> I say, yeah, that's my grandson, he just turned 19. And uh, yeah, he, he's a nice looking uh, young man. But it's here that's most important, here yeah. and here. You know, you can have all the good looks, but time takes care of all pretty. Well, what, you know, what better mentor than you mm -hmm. for him to have and what a blessing that is. Yeah, I think I'm thankful for it. I can pass it on to him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to thank you so much for your time, for being here with me and, um, <clears throat> and for the music, and the, you know, the legacy that you that you've, you know, that you're leaving for the world that you have you know, that you're sharing, have shared with the world. Right. And, um, and just thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you as well <laughs> for having me 
be a part of this because oh. uh, I like to thank Miss Carol Miles, mm -hmm. you know, and Gerald Albright because mm -hmm. he played on uh, the Temptation 60th anniversary, uh, calling out your name. He's doing the sex, mm -hmm. and I said, "Oh, great to have him," you know. So uh, you did a wonderful job, though. Thank you. You know, for letting me come to this here magnificent, beautiful home. Yeah. When I grew up, I wanted to have one of these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your home is just as beautiful. I, you know, I walk around my house and, uh, I, yeah, it's not as quite a celebrity as this, but I love it. And, you know, it's just yeah. me, you know, so I don't need nothing gargantuan and being all that house by myself. Yeah. But it's got a nice uh, a little uh, feel about it, a little in intimacy, you know, it, it right touches. So I'm thankful for God for letting me have it. Well, I'm just so happy to have you as my cover story. Oh, thank you. For the contour of luxury, and it's such a treat. And yes, we have to thank Carol Miles for yes. putting us together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. All righty. You're a cutie pie, too. Oh, thank you. Yes. Mwah. I'm back at you. <laughs>